A website is never finished, especially a B2B tech website. Welcome to Forward Slash, the podcast that explores how B2B tech companies can leverage their websites to achieve fast, efficient, predictable, and scalable growth. In each episode, I take a big issue affecting the B2B tech landscape and then pick the brains of marketing leaders around the world to learn how the issue affects the questions B2B tech marketers should be asking about their websites and how to answer them. Let's get into it. Chris Walker, CEO of Refine Labs, demand generation and revenue marketing extraordinaire, an established and celebrated business leader in the B2B go-to-market space. And I think something that we probably just forget every now and then is just a normal guy, passionate about this stuff, uh, sharing your insights and, and growing a company out of it. And I just want to thank you. I've been following you for a year and I'm sure you get this a lot, but uh, the matter of fact tone that you take, you, you've become like the voice for the marketer. Um, so I really appreciate that. Really excited to have you on. How are you doing today, man? Adam, thanks for having me on there. And uh, yeah, I'm the, I could be viewed as the voice of the marketer because I, what, I've been a B2B marketer for eight eight plus years before I started my company. So it was really finding the voice for myself, all the things that I experienced and felt as a B2B marketer now being validated by a lot of people seeing that like I'm the voice. A lot of people say that I'm able to communicate things that they've always thought were true, but haven't been able to really articulate in the way that I do. And so I, I feel grateful to be able to share that with people and make an impact and for you to listen to my content. Thank you. And yeah, looking forward to uh, diving in today. Totally, totally. Yeah, thank you for connecting the dots that you've been connecting for the past five years. It's been a, it's been fun to, to to catch up on it. So really excited to have you here today, man. Going to be diving into just like B two B tech go to market strategy. What's wrong with it? What needs to change? Um, and how this necessary shift in perspective affects the roles, role slash roles. However, we want to go about this marketing websites play in B two B tech growth. Uh, but before we get into it, if you can uh, briefly educate us on. Refine Labs, what it is, who it's for, why they should care. I think it's probably a good place to start. Yeah, Refine Labs was built to fundamentally transform how B2B companies think about, measure, and execute their go-to-market strategies, which starts with marketing, but now is blending into what SDRs do and is blended into how sales runs and what we think about for revenue operations as like the layer uh, that runs it all. Um, and so thinking about how companies fundamentally transform how they look at it. Everyone grew up with the the... Uh, serious decisions demand waterfall. Let's get a bunch of MQLs. Let's process those into SQLs. Then we'll get them into opportunities and we'll have this little funnel that we'll build um, built around the idea that all MQLs are the same and that, and this was before any company was thinking about really an account-based sales model. It was just get MQLs. And that created a lot of really bad behavior, uh, a lot of sales and marketing alignment issues, a lot of lack of ROI lack of accountability to actual revenue production from the marketing team. And we're talking about things that are happening now, but this was also present seven years ago. Mm -hmm. um, now companies are trying to make this transition from a lead-based model to an account-based model, but there's no underlying frameworks about how to do it. How do we decide what's working and what's not? How do we look and quantify uh, the impacts of these programs? How do we decide where to invest an extra million dollars between BDRs, marketing, sales, headcount, programs, how are we going to make these decisions? How are we going to look at data? Um, and how should we be thinking about it? Um, ABM vendors have done a great job helping people realize they need to move from a lead-based model to an account-based model, but have not yet figured out how to operationalize that inside of a company so that it, it overall works. They figured out how to have BDRs cold called MQAs. Sure, they figured out how to do that. At the tactical level and at the micro level, they've had they've made strides that improve go-to-market, in my opinion, um, but no overall operating system for how the go-to-market should run. You'd expect or you'd think based on the role of revenue operations that this is where that responsibility would sit, but that's not where, not what I'm seeing in practice. Revenue operations knows what they're doing right now isn't working, um, but there's got to be, there has to be the same level of a serious decisions demand waterfall. Something, someone needs to create that for the new world the new framework in which we operate, we're doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do it with our with our customers, which we work with, we've worked with more than 250 B2B companies over the past four and a half years. Um, and we also aggregate tons of smart B2B marketing teams inside of our product and community called The Vault. We think about it as a network of people that are running experiments, sharing ideas and moving the overall profession forward. 
Um, and so, and the goal being that manufacturing revenue is, can be used down to a science, but in order to actually do the science, we need to fundamentally think differently about what we do in science. You have milliliters and how to measure standardized way to measure blood pressure and all of these different things. And in, in go to market, we have none of those things, no way to standardize measure. So every company defines pipeline the same. One company is saying, oh, it's pipeline, and their sales team wins that pipeline at 4%. And another mm -hmm. company is over saying, this is pipeline, and they win that at 50%. And so, and when you bring that together, one company is over here saying, yeah, we created $100 million in pipeline last year, but they win it at 4%. So it's not really pipeline. And then all these companies are over there following what the company that built $100 million in pipeline that they win at 4%, they follow what, it, what they're doing. Um, and so instead, we would like to cr make it more of a science where we have actual standardized data, where we think about this in terms of research, where we can use statistics and things like that to determine what are the right things to do, which accounts for all of the confounding variables in there. So just because HubSpot did something and then HubSpot mm. was successful doesn't mean that the marketing tactic was the reason that HubSpot was successful. It could be correlation, not causation. It, maybe the marketing tactic didn't matter at all and HubSpot was going to be just as successful anyway. But right now, companies read that in a blog or a LinkedIn newsletter and say, oh, we should put that in place at our Series B startup. HubSpot was successful with it. It must work for us. Mm -hmm. And we need to have much more rigor um, in terms of what are the best practices, how should we operate, um, what's the data supporting this. Um, and so that's something that my company is trying to do which by the way, has not been done before. All the serious decisions, all the people that give advice about what to do and go to market don't actually do it. They get paid to give advice and they get paid to recommend technology. Um, and so we need, and we need someone out there that's actually in the work, in the trenches with hundreds of companies, solving real problems, and then looking at the patterns that they see at scale and data at a large scale, and then giving those insights back to the market to move the profession forward. So that's what we're doing here. Got it. Thank you for taking me through that. Um, let's dive into that. There's there was a video that you posted recently that I thought was was really interesting. There's a specific metric uh, that you keep mentioning that uh, you're surprised that business leaders are not talking about. And I'm I'm going to get to it, but I wanted to you up here. This is basically kind of a recap of what you just said. But specifically for B2B tech, B2B SaaS, the reality of the market right now is smaller and shrinking markets, generally very competitive. Blind buyer journeys, this is one of your big narratives, the dark social and dark funnel, bigger buyer groups, and that's obviously going to depend on, on the, the product, but for the most part, there seems to be a trend towards bigger buyer groups, longer sales cycles, fewer deals. It's harder to make or to generate predictable revenue these days. We're starting to see more considered effort to understand the concepts behind demand creation, demand capture, and the idea of customer marketing. But as you recently shared, few B2B tech SaaS business leaders are considering customer acquisition costs and CAC payback is key business jabber, like pretty crazy metrics to gloss over, We're trying to switch over to a customer centric go to market motion here. What's happening here, man? Like, what, what are you saying? What's the reason for this? To be clear, somebody in the company is looking at total cost of acquisition, like the finance department, probably looking at that all sales and marketing costs divided by the number of customers that you acquired during that time. They're looking at that and they're trying to interpret CAC payback. The difference is that given the revenue multiples and valuations in SaaS that have gone down significantly over the past couple of years, that their allowable CAC that they used to be fine running at a five-year CAC payback now has to really come down um, and so because the, the revenue multiples are down. What the interesting thing is, is when you start looking at it in individual programs, when you have a framework of how to look at it and you set up your measurement in the right way, and then you start to look and say, what is the $600,000 a year investment in content syndication doing for us? What is the $3.3 million last year that we spent on all of our events from virtual, hybrid, big type of shows, hyper-local? What can we glean from all that data to inform what we do next instead of just saying, oh, we spent 3.3 on events last year, let's increase it by 15% next year which is a lot of how they look at the last year's budget and then they just sort of like makes a couple of tweaks to it instead of saying, we need to rip this shit out, take a couple million dollars and go make a bold move. And so when you look at an individual programs, it becomes clear that a couple of the things where a lot of money is being spent are not delivering ROI and the data is crystal clear. 
And then when you're able to recoup that budget and start thinking differently, then you can start deploying those and making other investments work better in launching new investments, et cetera. It kicks off the like saying no, these couple of things that we've done for the past five years aren't working, saying no to them, and then refer deferring focus and resources to other things can be a real Kickstarter to uh, to do some of these things. And a lot of it comes down to the idea of are you able to ditch your MQL as a core mar marketing KPI? Mm -hmm. I've MQLs become the major, uh, the obvious, like where a lot of spend goes and a lot of time gets spent by sales resources and a lot of stuff happens and they create a lot of data around it. But when you look at actual results, close one revenue and sales velocity and CAC, you're not actually getting what you need out of it to justify keep doing the program. That makes a lot of sense. And I guess inherent to that, this was also, um, I'm going to be pulling a, a lot of your quotes uh, that I've been seeing recently. You had an interesting take on what CAC payback should look like. You mentioned that if you have low CAC payback, that probably means you're not spending enough on marketing. And if you look under the hood, these companies are probably only growing at like 10, 15%. Can you walk me through that? Because I feel like this is something that's probably being missed um, in a lot of companies. Yeah. So before that, I just want to like reframe with people of what CAC really means. It means that if your customer acquisition cost is lower, it means that you get more customers with the same amount of money, which is what you want. You want hmm. the, mo the most, co most high quality, long paying, high LTV customers for the least amount of money. That's what you want to do. I have seen it before where a company's registering like a one month CAC payback, but it's because the category is mature and they don't spend anything in sales and marketing. So it could be an indicator that we should spend more. But my sort of view on this has shifted over time. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it's possible for CAC to be too low. And it's definitely possible. Like most companies are struggling with customer acquisition costs that is too high. Um, and so that's the the low end becomes, I would say, the exception, not the norm. And having have, trying to low having a high CAC payback that you're trying to lower is typically the situation that companies are in. Thanks for taking me through that. I'd, I'd like to pick your brain around some marketing websites. I think a strong argument can be made. It's not even a strong argument. It's just like this is what companies should be doing. The website, the marketing website, should span across the entire customer journey. Past acquisition, we're talking activation, retention, expansion, evangelism. But for the grand majority of B2B tech companies, the website experience is pretty much the same for prospects as it is customers. From where we're sitting, is a little strange, right? Should the website have information for your customers to be your current customers that pay you right now to be more successful, to be able to share success stories and things like that? Yeah, that makes perfect sense to do it. The real question is how. Mm hmm question ends up being how is it like does it happen on the on the core website is there a part inside of our product where it happens does it happen in a slack community that's happens for our customers or a different type of platform um that's where i don't really have a perspective yet could the website do it sure um ha, do be have the strategies about what a website does for b2b companies changed all that significantly in the past five to ten years outside of in the scale, like reaching of product led growth, not really like the introduction of self service was a really big step forward in how a website's being used. But um, yeah, I think, yes, we should be doing stuff for current customers. I think the ha like the engine of how is the place where I think we could continue chatting. So there's a couple different avenues that, that, that we can go down here. And I guess I'm curious, I I'm curious what you're seeing your customers doing. Because what does Refine Labs do? The whole the whole idea is to become efficient before you scale, right? Let's just say a company just closed on a big Series A funding round. They want to bring Refine Labs into the equation to get everything set up uh, so that they can get, be ready to scale. What do the conversations look like as far as, or like where does the website fall in those conversations? I imagine you're probably, you know, the first place you start is paid and switching around that budget. So the process is to build from bottom up. So like we actually don't touch paid channels before we fix attribution and, and like optimize the website. But step one is the analysis, run the analysis, identify, use the data to inform the future strategy. Then we finish the analysis. We're going to clean up all of the 
basically install our analytics system into their CRM and marketing automation platforms. So we have proprietary analytics of how we're looking at things, measuring things, stamping opportunities, tracking them, reporting. And then from there, the next step is what we call demand conversion, which is the website, the handoff process between the website to sales for optimizing for speed to booked meeting, not speed to lead follow-up, speed to booked meeting, um, optimizing your demo uh, or main CTA flow, optimizing the hero and main navigation of the website become places where there's a lot of uh, juice to be squeezed without a lot of additional costs. So the website actually does become something that we do before we actually push buttons in, in paid channels. And then it would be demand capture. So you're going to talk affiliate channels, SEO and SEM, uh, retargeting flows, things like that. And then you got demand creation after that, which is going to be cold audiences on primarily paid social channels, targeted paid. And then six months later, laying on, uh, layering on our dark social thought leadership strategy, which involves virtual events that feed a podcast, that feed social media content, that build a community, that then feed the events and create a flywheel. That's the whole process over a 12-month period of time. You take a company from where they are right now to changing the entire attribution and KPI system to align sales and marketing, to actually know what's working and what's not, to shut off a bunch of things that they know aren't working, but haven't been able to, to really move on them to help them launch net new net new programs, convert demand better, get better aligned with sales. That is what we're trying to do with companies. 12 months later, you have an entirely new system and a way of operating how you report to the board, how you think about making changes, how you do forecasting and modeling and planning. That's the transformation that we try and help companies go through. Is there anything that you're noticing trending across websites, whether it's, and this can be across like business stages or maybe like the PLG motion or sales motion, but just like when you're hopping onto websites, when you're trying to make your own purchase, like, is there anything that like just jumps out to you? Like, God, I wish more people would do this. Or like you leaned into um, booking meetings. I'm assuming that's one of the biggest parts that you're seeing pipeline leakage. And that's directly attributable to the website, right? If somebody clicks a book, a book, a demo, um, and it's taking three days for the SDR to get in touch, that's obviously an issue. What else are you seeing out there that you wish more B2B companies would lean into from their marketing website perspective? Yeah, I mean, the the booking meetings automatically upon like a, what we call a declared intent and ver conversion, a qualified account saying, hey, I want to talk to your sales team about buying now. Having that meeting booked is a huge inefficiency and you can cl come close to doubling your pipeline production with no additional spend and a little bit of ops investment. Um, the problem is most companies can't do that because there's so much garbage going into their demo form that they would book a bunch of trash on their meeting. So you actually need to, you can't just go to book a meeting, you have to clean the funnel first. Um, so that's one thing you have to do so that like at least 50 to 75% of people that are filling out that form work for a qualified account have high intent to buy and are going to sit on that meeting. Um, so it's not like you can just pull up Calendly and put this on your website at a $50 million company. There's actually a lot more that goes into it. It feel, it sounds simple, but it's, and it is simple if you have the right pieces in place, but you need the right pieces in place. Other things that I think are the trends that I'm seeing or things that I notice on a, on a continuous basis um, is that companies that are trying to merge PLG and enterprise sales together really struggle. Even some of the best ones that you all, that a lot of people on LinkedIn glorify as like P, the best PLG companies, they still struggle with it because they, they um, think about, they have their PLG team that's responsible to get all of these free trial signups. And then they have their enterprise team that's responsible for doing things to all those signups to try and get some, somebody on an enterprise plan. And they both end up, they are competing with one another for budget and credit and stuff like that. Just like the same marketing and sales MQL machine now created between growth or PLG and enterprise. What we need is we need to look at this as a holistic go-to-market and not have separate teams with these two, two separate goals. That's a, that's a trend that I see. Companies that want to do this, whether they started PLG and now they're trying to add enterprise and they bring all their PLG mindset into enterprise and it doesn't work. Or you got all the enterprise companies that are, want to launch PLG to be cool, and they launch a free trial button. Their demo volume goes from 200 a month to 20 a month because everyone's now going into the free trial. The free trial sucks, and they don't convert. And they would have had 100 plus sales meetings that month, and instead they have five because they launched a free trial and they the product isn't ready. 
either way, companies are really struggling with this dual motion. Companies are starting to make more moves in like ungated product tours and things like that to got, have buyers be able to guide themselves independently further down the buying process instead of having a meeting with a person to basically deliver you a recorded debt, like robotic recorded demo. I think product tours and other things that can facilitate independent buying are smart. Um, a lot of people still use gated things like, hey, fill out this form in order to watch this video, which I think people should just stop mm -hmm. um, and have the confidence in your product and your marketing that if somebody sees the product demo and likes it, that you can convert them into a sales call rather than getting their information and then chasing them around if, if whatever. Um, the last thing that I see, and there's plenty of other things that I'm just calling out a couple of things that came top, top of mind. Companies continue to have a pricing page and not show the fucking price. <laughs> it's different in PLG. You know what I mean? $7 per user per month than a $12 plan. It's different with companies that scale by user growth or other usage-based models. But um, in like a, like the traditional enterprise SaaS motion, like having a plan that costs $2,000 a month and not putting the price on your website seems incredibly short-sighted. And if you, the way to figure this out would be very easy. Go pick your all your tier one accounts or a sample of them. If you're a smart enterprise company, you have a list of tier one accounts. Pick them out, decide who the decision maker is in that company, then send them a survey. And the survey can be one question. It can be, would you like to know the price of a product before engaging with the sales rep? Yes or no? Or you could ask it less directly. What are the steps that you would like to accomplish before engaging with a sales rep to buy this type of technology? I would like to know the price. I would like to talk to somebody at a different company that's already used the product. I would like to read reviews on G2. I would like to see a product demo, whatever your customer says. I guarantee you that a high percentage of your tier one account decision makers would say they want to know the price before they talk to your sales rep. That's as easy as it gets. Listen to customers and, and people have a million different objections to this. So we need to show value first. Oh, it's too, our pricing is too complicated. We need a human to describe it. If we put it on the website, they're going to think it's too expensive. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> um, we got, we have to this, the, uh, and you're seeing vendors take a lot of advantage of this. Uh, uh, it's their name is vendor. Um, but companies that are trying to start to intercept the procurement and negotiation process from SaaS because SaaS sales has been full of discounting and a lot of other sales behaviors that may not fit in this new world of buying. And so they're resorting, instead of buying from your rep, they're going to buy through a procurement firm like vendor and get the best price and the best terms with volume. Um, and you're going to lose margin because vendor is going to sell it for you instead of you selling it direct, all because you didn't do what the customer wanted. I'm with you. I think there should be some element of pricing regardless, whether it's just starting at something or maybe there's like a tiered element to it. But the, the, the first thought that comes to my mind when I hear, oh, I don't want to put pricing you know, on the page because it's, uh, you know, we, we don't want to scare customers off. It's just like, it's like you said, it's like, do you, do you have customers? Are they paying for the product? It's like, go out there and find more of them and then use the pricing page as a positioning exercise more than anything to help provide that clarification. The other thing I want to touch upon is also, yeah, the struggle with ABM and PLG. And this was a conversation that I had with the CTO of Mad Kudu, whose product helps this motion. And it's, they're in the PQL engine, if you will. One of the studies that he came out with recently was that PLG doesn't work for businesses bigger than mid, mid market businesses, which makes complete sense. Like you're not going to have a, a bank of America that's going to put your product on their website to test it out. Like that's just not going to happen. There has to be another motion uh, that, that kind of connects these dots, which I thought was pretty interesting. I don't know if I just uh, reiterated everything that, that you just said, but anything else you want to add there? It's clearly a place where companies are struggling. It's clear if you look at the companies that have gone public or had very large exits that um, as you, you can start PLG, but to continue to scale, you need seven figure accounts that have tons of users or whatever your usage based pricing model is in order to scale. And those customers have the best retention. They have the longest lifetime value. They have the highest ACVs. There's just, and then once you're in, you're really sticky because there's so many users in the product. 
but there's all there's a lot of downsides to it. Security concerns. A lot of times, PLG companies are trying to sell a product to the enterprise that isn't enterprise grade or doesn't mm-hmm. have the right offer. There's a lot of issues overall. But I think the like, from a go to market perspective, these competing objectives is because companies think about them as independent instead of one one customer journey. Whether they come in and it's Bank of America that asks for a demo, or whether a manager in Bank of America signs up for the free trial and then somebody else comes and asks for a demo, it doesn't matter. Did we close at more enterprise customers last month or not? It's also not a serial process where you just shove a bunch of people into a free trial and then try and do growth hacking to get mm. the, to get the company from a free trial to a PQL and then cold call the director of IT and pitch them on your SOC 2 enterprise plan and close them. Um, and that's what a lot of companies try and do is they try and they try and get one user in and then try and do performance marketing to get a bunch of other people in and then hope that it turns into an enterprise plan. It's entirely different when you're selling to an enterprise. You need to convince the leadership at the company that there is a need to fundamentally change one of their business processes using your tool. The viral growth loops and things like that are mostly a fairy tale. And when you if you want to have significant user expansion in enterprise accounts, you're going to have to figure out your enterprise value proposition. You're going to have to figure out how to do account-based marketing or enterprise marketing, whatever you want to call it. And you're going to have to figure out how to properly measure these two separate or together go to market motions to know whether or not it's working. A lot of companies struggle with what's the ROI of our ABM thing because they can get $50 free trial users for a million dollars a month for Google paid. And because they don't have this, they have a different mindset on it. They bring that mindset into enterprise. But I think that's, yeah, that's what I got on this one. I, I interact with a lot of companies. A few of them get it right. A lot of companies struggle, especially as a net new motion. Like a lot of these like PLG companies that are trying to do an ABM pilot. It's so crazy. They like want, they're trying to build the unicorn business. Um, and they know clearly that they need an enterprise motion to be successful. And then they drum up an ABM pilot for three months and they run ads for six weeks. And then they say, okay, I guess this was, this pilot was a failure. Let's uh, just move on now. And it's like, that's not how, ha- this isn't how it works. People were talking about why ABM fails in like 2017. And this was the main thing. Companies don't create a timeline that makes sense for a type of program like this. And you see that continued pattern with uh, specifically PLG companies, enterprise companies, especially more mature companies are getting a lot better at understanding the time windows, uh, the time windows of measuring success better. PLG companies still think very short term and performance oriented, even when going after enterprise accounts. But you brought up ABM and ABX. That has to be an aligned motion uh, in order for it to work properly. High level question here. How do you have that conversation with siloed go-to-market functions? Or is that a customer that you say no to? Like you have to be, this has to be something that you get before you become a customer. Or if not, how difficult are those conversations to align go-to-market motions around an ABX strategy? The little secret in here is that nobody knows what they're doing here, including us. We're all figuring it out together. There is no existing framework. There's no way to operationalize it. Some companies have had success with PLG. Was it because of their marketing? Was it because of the product? It was probably most likely because of the product and the funding, maybe not the marketing. You do have PLG companies that have been successful, but there's no repeatable motion for companies to do. And everybody's basically reinventing the wheel for themselves. If I was like, you can't work with us if you're like that situation, then I would get no customers. Every PLG company operates under this current assumption. So Uh, The first thing that you do, if you're trying to drive change in an industry, you see what the current state is, which is what I'm doing. You evaluate that current state. You look for patterns. You try and understand the root cause of those patterns. Then you start to think about solutions. Then you operationalize those solutions for companies, beta, test it out and roll it out. We're in the like early phases of that, but um, no company has this figured out. And all companies look at them as as two different teams with two different budgets, with Mm -hmm. two core different sets of KPIs, measure the success of your enterprise marketing based on how much enterprise pipeline you create quarter over quarter against the spend, regardless of where they come from. Whether it was a PQL, a free trial sign up, a demo request form, you got them at an event, a field marketing event, who cares? Did you create did you create enough pipeline for the amount of money that you deployed at those set of accounts? But instead they're like, oh, we're only going to look at the enterprise if they came through the demo form or 
a lot of the old stuff, like companies that are don't have PLG and just have ABM have been more mature about thinking about an all bound model. Like we need to, we need to think about an all bound model for PLG where the product is just one of the new all bounds, one of the new mm -hmm. bounds. Then you have outbound, then you have your website, then you have events, then you have partners. Um, and your product just becomes another part of that. But um, PLG companies haven't quite gotten there yet. We're working on frameworks and we're not there yet either. Um, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a very interesting problem to tackle. I want to dive into this a little bit. The fact that we're, we're all still trying to figure this whole ABM, ABX thing out. There's a framework that I recently uh, discovered. It's called the Jobs to be Done Framework that came out in the 90s. And this guy's name is Tony Ulwick. He has an agency called Stratagen, and they help Fortune 500s around product innovation. We've basically been exploring taking this framework from product innovation and overlapping it onto the website. And this can be anything from like a website strategy to a content strategy uh, ideate or ideation process. The framework breaks every job into eight steps, regardless of whether you're brushing your teeth or you're hosting an event. It starts with defining the issue, aligning with the teams, setting everything up, executing, monitoring, re, re whatever. I can't remember all of these eight steps. Most tools operate in the execute and monitor phase. What if marketing reached out to customers to understand basically all of the steps around the product, creating content that lead into the product and content that leads out of it based on all of the eight steps uh, of this job. I'm rambling here a little bit, but I'm curious what you think about this. Sounds like a good idea. I try to break this very logically that if you have to break the marketing function, you basically have two things. You have strategy or what a lot of people call product marketing. Um, and then you have demand and which is, uh, there's also strategy to it, but it's very, it's, uh, action oriented where strategy is more art. We have sure. to listen to customers. We have to come up with these new, the new positioning. There's a lot of art to it. My belief is that on the demand side, we can look at it more like a science. We can say, assuming the strategy is right, which is the art. If we do these things in this way, then we should expect this result with some level of statistical confidence because it's been tested across 25 plus other companies. And this is what the data says. And so I'd like to get to that level on the demand side, recognizing that a framework definitely can help you build the art on the strategy side. Um, but we're thinking about frameworks in a, a little bit of a different way, which is like, how do you actually go out and do these things, right? There's a framework, how we think about attribution, splitting attribution, splitting the funnel. Like there are some parallel concepts that we use, um, but where this, this breaks down is actually in the tactical execution. Like every company wants to adopt, not every company, many companies are adopting ABM because they want to move from a lead-based model to an account-based model. They go out and buy an expensive tool, um, and then they realize that they still don't have what they need in order to operationalize it. They need the underlying framework of how we actually do this. Vendors, ABM vendors haven't provided it yet. Some of them are reaching out to me for them for me to help them build it, which I'm open to. I'm open to collaborating and actually moving the profession forward because them and I have the same goal in helping companies do this correctly. The idea of frameworks is really helpful, especially when validated across a lot of companies. Makes sense. Thanks for taking me through that. So you have the vault, this this uh, this product that you recently, I think you launched it this year. Um, can you tell me a little bit about it, what it is, uh, what you're trying to accomplish it, accomplish with it, and if anything in there kind of speaks to what we were talking about today at all? The Vault is a network of the most forward-thinking and innovative B2B marketing teams that come together to push the profession forward, whether that's like collaborative experimentation, publishing new research and best practices, leveraging all of the best practices that and frameworks that we've been able to have for companies to basically implement a new way to do demand. We've got the playbook and the process started um, and recognize that we would achieve the impact much more quickly if it was collaborative and a lot of people were working on it. So it's not like Refine Labs is telling us what to do. The goal is for us to all build it together. And that's what the, the vault is really for. It's a place where hundreds of B2B marketing teams that want to adopt the strategies that we're adopting congregate to learn and implement all of these strategies alongside experts at my company and hundreds of other companies that are trying to do the same thing. 
and knowing that the playbook isn't perfect and the playbook will never be done, but we can build it together. And there's never been anything like that done before. If you look at it, you're kind of building the GitHub for marketing. Sure. I think that is a super fascinating concept. It's something that I've been working on. It's something that I would have wanted as a B2B marketer early in my career. And the companies that are in there are having a lot of success and uh, we'll continue to invite other pe other uh, people into the group as we go. Thank you. Last question here before we dive into uh, just a, a couple of quick rapid fire questions. A lot of marketers are saying, talk to your customers, easier said than done. Where's a good place to start? Is it with gong calls? Is it with hopping on the phone with your top tier customers? Is it all of the above? Where do you start? There's two potential best places to start. One of them could be your best customers. They like you. Uh, they're successful with the product, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes if you're a, you're a marketer and you work in a company that doesn't have an aligned go-to-market function, then the sales rep or the account manager says, hey, marketer, don't go talk to my best customers. Stay out of there. So you might not be able to because of organizational politics. Another avenue that I've actually found to be highly successful is the first thing that you do is you go to the same conferences that your customer goes to and you attend, the, you follow them and you attend the same sessions that they're going to and you listen to all the messaging and positioning that they hear from thought leaders. Then you go and interview the thought leaders that were speaking and get their perspective. Then you start to form your opinion. Then when you actually go and talk to the market, you know what the fuck you're talking about. So one of the biggest things in customer research, like CMOs love talking to me. Why? Because I'm valuable and I help them on every call. Um, I also recognize when I was a B2, when I was a marketing manager that customers talked to me less because I was less valuable and I was selling to physicians, not marketers. So I wasn't as valuable to them, which therefore made them less likely to have a conversation with me. So what you need to do is figure out how do I have the credibility and value to, to attract my target customer to have a conversation with me? When I started my company, no CMOs wanted to talk to me. Now I could send a DM to almost any CMO and get a 15-minute meeting. And that's five years of work, both learning, growing, producing content, being consistent, helping a lot of people, helping a lot of companies. It's just trust and credibility like that doesn't get built overnight. I went through a very similar experience uh, just producing this podcast. This is, I think this is episode 20. This podcast is for CMOs and VPs of marketing, reaching out to them initially just to let them know that, you know, do you want to be a guest? I wasn't getting any responses. I would actually see the CMO or the VP of marketing land on my LinkedIn profile and never respond. And yeah, I internalized that as um, I need to obviously be a little bit more authentic, show that I know what I'm talking about, connect with the right people. It's almost like an element of peacocking, if you will. But there has to be that, that degree of genuineness that you understand the language and they have to hear that coming back from you. And I, I feel like that's just like a duh moment. Like we know that, but for whatever reason, we just stick to our own like first party, non-qualitative data. But that's just more of an aside. I'm, I'm completely with you on that. Final rapid fire questions for you here. What question do you wish podcast hosts would stop asking you if there's any? I just don't have an answer to this one. I don't care. <laughs> So many podcasts that I, I'm able to take a question and take it in whatever direction I feel at that time. So I never wish someone asked me a question. I never wish people don't ask me questions. It's just not how I think. Fair enough. Who are your sources of inspiration? Honestly, I get a lot of inspiration from actually doing the activities. I get a lot of inspiration from the leadership team that I work with, the team that I serve, the, the all the companies and CMOs and marketing teams and RevOps teams that we get to work with, um, all the people that listen to my podcast and LinkedIn content and have a ton of success, hundreds, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people at that scale that I've been able to positively impact. That's what keeps me motivated and committed. Beautifully said. Any upcoming events that you're going to be part of? It's mostly the podcast circuit right now. Oof. Um, there's a couple, <laughs> of them. A couple of potential speaking ops, one in San Francisco, one in Chicago, uh, one in Boston. Nothing confirmed, but those are all looking sometime in uh, Q4. I've been doing a lot virtually. Honestly, like when it, I, I love speaking in person, but between the, tr the travel and the time out of office and things like that, it's difficult to justify it being worth my time sometimes. Um, so that's something that I battle because I get a ton of scale digitally. And obviously, in-person events are important, but I've been a lot more selective 
And when I'm doing speaking, especially if it requires me to get on a plane, stay at a hotel for a couple of days and think, you know, be out of my office away from my team and customers, um, that I got to, I have to be able to justify that trip, whether it's by visiting other customers or, uh, things like that. Then, because a lot of people like 2021, I was getting paid 50 grand to do a speech, 30, 50 grand, um, and for a one hour speech. And now people are asking me to do them for free because the economy is different. And so it's a very, it's a very different game, uh, when you're paying your own way to go speak in front of 50 people. Um, so that's where we are. I'll continue to do stuff digitally. This event space, the event like space will bounce back overall. Um, and the best part for me, as I continue to think through this is that it's nice to speak, but a lot of companies need that speaking slot. And for me, I have the leverage. I don't need it. I, ha I have the audience. I actually have a, probably a larger audience than the event. And it just becomes a key lesson in you need, to own, you need to own a direct relationship with the customer. You need to own your distribution rather than going through middleman, like paying some conference so you $20,000 sponsorship so your CEO can speak for 20 minutes. That was not Absolutely. rapid fire. I apologize, but we'll keep no. it time. No, you're good. That was a loaded question. That's all I got for you, man. Thank you so much. This has been great. Um, you know, this is, this is, is a, it, it's a pretty new podcast, still kind of finding our legs. So really appreciate the, the support early on. Um, this is really fruitful for us. Hopefully not the last time we have you on, but thank you so much for, for educating uh, me and the listeners on this stuff. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Good luck with the show. Episode 20 is just in the early stages. So keep it rolling. <laughs> will do will do thank you very much cool